I, I now have the great pleasure of uh, introducing uh, Dr. Patrick Lynn, who will speak about ethical concerns surrounding autonomy and the role of, uh, role of engineering in the development and, and use. He has uh, published several books and papers in the field of, of technology ethics with respect to nanotechnology, human enhancement, robotics, cyber warfare. He has uh, also been uh, featured on national and international media, such as BBC, Forbes, National Public Radio, for his work on ethics and autonomous systems. Uh, please welcome Patrick Lynn to the podium. Thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. So yes, I will be talking today about uh, ethics and autonomous systems, picking up where, where Joey left off. Um, as a uh, quick peek of, uh, of the agenda, I want to do this in three parts. So Act 1 will be setting up some background and context for why uh, this conversation is important. Um, Act 2 uh, will be focusing on a specific issue that I think is shared uh, across all AI th to varying degrees. And then I'll close it up with, um, with some uh, final thoughts. Um, as quick background, uh, yes, it's true, I'm a philosopher, and that's weird. Um, but I work in technology ethics, which means I'm very much at home uh, with engineers. Um, in the last 15 years of, of doing technology ethics, I've been working with institutions where you normally wouldn't expect to find a philosopher, uh, such as the United States Naval Academy, Stanford Engineering, and, uh, the, and UNIDIR, United Nations Think Tank on Weapons. Um, currently, I'm, I still work with Stanford Law School's Center for Internet and Society, uh, the 100-year study on AI, and the World Economic Forum, looking exactly at AI and robot ethics. Um, and we do the usual academic stuff, um, you like write books and papers. We just had a book come out last month from Oxford University Press called Robot Ethics 2.0. Um, but we also do a lot of uh, media work, so interviews and media writing, because as Joey said, we're all participants here in this system. We're all stakeholders in a, in a technology-driven world. And we actually get a lot of real-world interest in having, having this guidance in technology ethics. So we're, we're invited by uh, government agencies and industry all the time to, to help them think through law and policy. Okay, so um, let's just dive into it. Let's look at some um, AI across uh, the several domains, uh, land, uh, air, sea, and space. And then I'm going to suggest there's actually two more domains that we shouldn't forget. Um, but first, let me start with a, with a working definition of AI. Um, so it's not super complicated, but I want to say that AI is not this magical, mystical thing. It's really just complex computer program um, that's designed to automate decisions and actions. And it does it with this appearance of intelligence. And that's, that's pretty much it. Um, this summer, I was having a conversation with Joey, and he said he made a comparison uh, between AI and a bureaucracy. And at the time, I thought that was, that was really weird. But the more I think about it, I think that analogy actually holds. So a bureaucracy and a policy, well, what do they do? They define and automate certain decisions, just like AI. And I think this foreshadows, uh, this foreshadows a, uh, an ethical problem with all of them, which is that if you're not careful, you could slip in some systemic risk and other vulnerabilities. Um, and some more introductory notes. Um, as, as I talk about autonomous systems, what, I, what I'm including here are AI and robotics. Um, but an AI is the brains, right, that, that runs the whole thing. So, um, so oftentimes, I'll, I'll just talk about AI, but I, I do mean this whole thing. And the examples of AI I'm going to show you and the examples of ethical issues, they're not complete. This is just a sampler's plate of, of ethics. Um, and, uh, and many of the ethical issues I'm going to talk about are connected or arise from the autonomy itself, but some are actually effects of the autonomy, such as um, loss of jobs or economic displacements. Okay, so basically, uh, where can you find AI? Well, you find AI in all, of the, all the domains. AI is already reaching into all the major domains. So on land, we have AI in our everyday devices, uh, from smartphones in your pockets to smart thermostats and, and, and connected refrigerators, self-driving cars, factory robots, uh, mall security robots. Uh, in the air, well, our commercial airplanes are already uh, autonomous, um, and we see we see that creeping in uh, um, in 
in civilian drones. Uh, military drones have, a lot, have had a lot of attention. Uh, military drones, though, right now are really semi-autonomous, but uh, the military does have uh, more autonomous systems, um, such, as, such as cruise missiles. And in the sea, well, I mean, basically any place where you can replace a human being, or basically any place where you find a human being is a market for AI. So uh, we already, we're already seeing autonomous surface ships, autonomous submarines. Uh, there's also already autonomous naval weapon systems. In an outer space, uh, researchers are working on robot astronauts. Not all human astronauts are happy about losing their jobs to a robot. Um, that's, that's one issue. Uh, we see AI in Mars rovers and satellites and, and other uh, systems. Okay, so those are the four major domains, but I want to suggest there are two more that we can't forget about. Another domain is inner space. So basically the space that's, that's not outside our bodies, the space that's inside our bodies. So AI is already being used for, uh, say, medical diagnoses to help us healthier. But the AI is also being connected to us more intimately. So we have, for instance, augmented reality flight helmets or heads-up displays in, the, uh, um, in uh, jet, jet craft. And, and this gives us, uh, and this means AI is shaping the way we view the world. Uh, Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla, has plans to develop a neural link or a neural lace which connects a human brain to a computer or AI to help us keep up with these digital systems. Uh, and also, there, there have been many, there's been a lot of work on, uh, on uh, you know, neurotechnology, so hook, hooking up a uh, human brain with a computer. And the computer can read your thoughts and even read your dreams to, to some extent. Okay, so we can't forget about inner space, and also we shouldn't forget about cyberspace. There is AI making headways in, in cyber operations. So I'm uh, thinking about uh, off offensive operations and defensive operations. As Joey pointed out, uh, AI is being used in real world expert systems for uh, criminal sentencing and hiring and banking, and AI is being used by medicine and science to discover scientific principles that not even humans had discovered. So they're, they're making real progress. So you might imagine that with all these different forms of, of AI and robotics, they raise different kinds of issues, from job displacement uh, to unclear responsibility, privacy, psychological effects, right? So I mean, so, I mean this issue comes up um, most prominently with, say, sex robots. Uh, there are worries of, of military AI arms race. But I'm going to focus on, on this one issue uh, up top, proper decision making. So if AI is really about super automation, right, super auto automation of decisions, we can ask, are we doing that right? Okay, so let's focus on this issue of, of decision making. And I want to say that there are three types of decisions, and we're going to be focusing on the last two. There are decisions that are right, there are decisions that are wrong, and then there's this weird gray space of decisions that are not wrong or not right. right? So there are, there are decisions that require a judgment call or an ethics call. And I don't want to make this easy for me. I want to give AI the best case possible. So I'm assuming that AI works as designed. Um, I'm assuming that none of the sensors are broken. I'm assuming that you know, the system has not been hacked. I think there's still a, uh, a validation problem. So um, we may have built it right, right. We may have built it to spec. But we can ask, did we build the right thing? Did we build what was actually needed? OK, so let's look at wrong decisions. So you might be familiar with this already. Uh, so one way AI can go wrong is by exhibiting emergent behavior, behavior we didn't expect and that we don't want. So you, we've already seen this with uh, stock market flash crashes. So autonomous financial trading bots you know, working against each other at, at lightning digital speed and just in crashing the stock market for, for uh, you know, milliseconds at a time. And this actually happens more often than you would think. Uh, and this happens because AI, again, is incredibly complex. And with complexity, you often get unpredictability. And when you have two autonomous systems meeting each other for the first time, then that compounds that unpredictability. Uh, several years ago, Amazon had this weird case where uh, the um, couple pricing uh, bots were basically having an auction between themselves um, over this used textbook on, I think, flies, and they drove up the price of this textbook to $23 million, right? <laughs> 
And, and there are other worries. If people are worried about AI armies, robotic armies, what happens if our robot army meets an adversary's robot army for the first time, right? So we can't predict what the effects are, and our adversary is unlikely to loan us their robot to make sure it, it's interoperable with, with ours. Uh, similar concern with self-driving cars. Will cars from different manufacturers be able to negotiate around each other and, and interoperate uh, without, without an industry standard, for instance? Uh, another, way, uh, another way an AI can make a wrong decision is if you game it. And one way to game it is to introduce an adversarial example. So I'm talking here about learning AI or neural nets that require tons of examples or training data to, to divine patterns and, and figure out things for themselves. So here's one, one example. So in uh, 2014, I believe, some uh, researchers from Google created a neural net, right, a learning AI that could uh, identify pandas and cats and things like that. And it does it by, uh, by showing millions of examples of what a panda and cat looks like, and the AI is, is, um, is supposed to figure out for itself what the pattern is to, to correctly identify the next example. So in this case, it, it, correct, it identified this image as, as being of a panda with a 60 degree uh, confidence rate. Then the researcher slipped in a tiny bit of noise into the, into the image. Right, so it's imperceptible to human beings, but we have these tiny pixel, pixelated noise in the background, and it comes up with this composite picture that the AI then thinks is a gibbon, right, a monkey with 99% confidence. So that's, that's one way you can trick AI by, uh, I mean, you, learning, learning agents by nature, well, we can't, we can't always predict what they're gonna learn. And if you uh, rely on learning through lots of data, all it takes is, is a couple of bad examples to poison the well. And you can see how this translates into a real world risk. So the image on the left is a scene that a camera from a self-driving car might be filming. Um, image on the right is how the AI or computer sees the world. So in this case, they might uh, classify and color code people as red. But if you introduce the right adversarial example, the people become invisible to the computer, right? So this is a problem. And recently, researchers have shown that you don't even need to hack into a system. All you really need is little bits of tape strategically placed on a sign, or you manipulate a sign just a tiny bit, and now all of a sudden, the stop sign, this, this right turn sign, look like 45 mile an hour speed limit signs to computers. So computer vision's still very hard. Uh, another, another way AI can go wrong is even if you're not gaming it, it could come up with the wrong answer, and Joey talked about this uh, a little bit already. It could, it could come up with biased answers. Um, and, and this applies uh, mostly to learning algorithms that depend on a, a lot of data in order to uh, do what it does. And if you start out with bad data, well, you have the garbage in, garbage out problem. Um, a famous example, uh, not to, I think it's still going on now, is if you are a man, and you go online and you're searching for a job, you'll be more likely to be shown job ads for CEO positions than you would be if you were a woman. And the reason is that, yes, historically, CEOs have been men, right? But that's, you know, that's, it's a faithful, accurate reflection of the data, but the data may be a broken reflection of society, right? It it's, could be that uh, CEOs were mostly men historically, and now to a large degree because of institutional uh, sexism and racism or, or explicit sexism and racism. Um, as my colleague Ryan Jenkins at Cal Poly puts it, algorithms tend to crystallize bias. So once it's in an algorithm, um, all you know, further thinking, further discussion tends to stop. It's kind of like a bureaucracy or policy. I'm sure you know many people who, you know, you, you, a bureaucracy arrives with a bad decision, they just kind of shrug and say, well, you know, that's the policy, or, you know, that, that's a bureaucracy. And more people, more people are being attuned to this. So there's a data scientist, Kathy O'Neill, who wrote this excellent book, Weapons of Math Destruction, and she puts it nicely. She said, algorithms are opinions embedded in code, which means that data and algorithms aren't as objective as you might think they are. All right, so now let's look at this more subtle category of decisions that are not wrong, or also not right. All right, so, um, so imagine this scenario. So imagine you are in a robot car, or 
You're in a robot car or you're programming a robot car and you're driving on you know, 495 or, or your favorite freeway, you're in the middle lane, and for whatever reason, you gotta swerve. Right? Maybe a little kid jumped in, in the front of the middle lane, you don't wanna run over this little kid, but you, could you need a swerve. So do you swerve to the right and hit this small car, a VW Bug, or do you swerve left and hit this larger car, in this case, a Volvo SUV? Well, I mean, there are reasons to go either way. Right? If you're worried about uh, other passengers, you should turn left, swerve left, and crash into the larger object. Larger object will, will protect those passengers better, especially uh, an SUV with a high passenger safety rating. On the other hand, if you're worried about your own life in the robot car, then you should crush that smaller vehicle. Right? <laughs> so either way is reasonable, but here's the thing. So once you make that decision, once you encode the decision, you seem to be now systematically discriminating against a particular class of vehicles through no fault of their own, other than the owners couldn't afford larger cars or the owners had large families. And um, it's important to remember that program decisions are premeditated decisions. And law and ethics treat these two differently, right? This is a difference between an innocent act, innocent accident and premeditated homicide, potentially. And this isn't just with weird crash scenarios. I mean, there are ethical dilemmas in everyday decisions uh, that a self-driving car has to make. So let's look at the case of where to position the car in a lane. So imagine you're driving, you're in a robot car, self-driving car, going down a narrow street of DC or Palo Alto or wherever you're from. And let's say, you know, uh, to, to this one side, there's a group of people and to the other side, there's one person, and you're on this narrow lane. Where do you position the car? Do you drive the car straight down the middle and you weigh all lives equally? Or is there an argument to be made to, to give the group of people more birth? Because you know maybe it's harder to predict what five people are gonna do versus one. Um, but if you do scooch away from the crowd and close to the one person, what does that say about how we value different lives and what we're willing to trade off? Or another scenario, imagine there's a school bus on one side and, uh, and this hipster bicyclist <laughs> on the other side. Well, how do you position the car? Do you drive it straight down the middle? I mean, there's an argument to be made that you should give the school bus more birth because it's, it's a large lumbering object and there's kids inside. On the other hand, uh, the bicyclist is unprotected, so maybe the bicyclist should have more birth. Which way do you go? There's no obviously right way Right? But, but notice this, if you do scooch away from one, like say, say you give the, the school bus more birth and you get closer to the bicyclist, notice that you're creating risk for the bicyclist by the increased proximity. Or more correctly, you're transferring risk from the school bus to the bicyclist, and no one asks you to do that. Right? So uh, my colleague uh, Noah Goodall at University of Virginia uh, first pointed this out to me. Uh, last scenario here with, with robot cars. So uh, future self-driving cars, well, they're going to have to select their own routes. They're going to have to select their own paths, especially if the, no one's in the car. And we actually have this problem today with Waze in a traffic navigation app. And I'm, 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 I'm actually a little surprised this hasn't come up yet. But if you use Waze, you'll know that there's, uh, there are many different ways you could take to a destination. Right, there's a more direct way, it could be shorter, or you know, it could take longer. And then there, there are other ways that might be slightly out of the way, um, uh, slightly longer. Sometimes the longer route is actually faster. But here's the thing, uh, Waze and other uh, traffic routing apps, they usually default to the fastest route. Right? Even if it's gonna save you one minute, it'll, it'll default to the fastest route. But sometimes the fastest route could be the more dangerous route. Right? So the fastest route could take you through a bunch of intersections or unprotected left turns, or uh, it, it'll ask you to take a shortcut through a quiet neighborhood that's not designed for through, uh, you know, for, designed for heavy traffic, there might be kids playing it. Uh, and if something happened, if an accident were to happen because the car chose this more dangerous route, arguably that could be on the manufacturer. And, and these ethical issues aren't just with, with self-driving cars. Uh, they also come up with military robotics. Um, uh, we're not gonna have time to go into this, but the laws of armed conflict have many conditions that require judgment calls, and there's a, there's a huge body of literature um, on that. 
Okay, so uh, let, let me fast forward a tiny bit and uh, close this out. So if, if this area of AI ethics, or autonomous system ethics is weird to you, it, it's usually uh, helpful to connect the unfamiliar with the more familiar. So let me try to do that now. So I wanna say that we can think of technology as superpowers, right? So, so drones, for instance, are giving us the ability to fly. Now with drones, you know, you could loiter on the, in the window of a 30 floor apartment building um, like, like Superman could. Uh, surveillance cameras and, and, and tiny sensors give us super senses, super vision, super hearing. Uh, AI combined with big data gives us omniscience, right? So, I mean, Facebook might know a lot more about your family tree and history than you even know. Uh, a few years ago, there's a famous case where Target, right, Target.com, knew that a guy's daughter was pregnant before the father even knew. Right? So that's omniscience. Uh, super strength. Well, bionic exoskeletons are giving us super strength. Uh, 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 biotechnology has given us uh, super metabolism. Military is working on soldiers who don't need to eat, soldiers who don't need to sleep, right? So they're hacking to the body. Nanotechnology has given us metamaterials, and some of which act like invisibility cloaks, right? Right out of Harry Potter. Um, I already talked about computer brain interfaces that, that essentially give us the power of telepathy. CRISPR and gene editing are giving us the ability to create mutants. These are literally superpowers that jump off the pages of comic books, right? So this is, uh, this is more familiar terrain. If that's right, we could think of technology ethics as superhero ethics. So think of technology ethics as asking the question, what happens when we get superpowers? How do superpowers change ethics? How does it change our institutions like privacy and education? How does it change our norms? Uh, you, you know, as the saying goes, great powers come with great responsibilities. New powers come with new responsibilities. Imagine if we're in Metropolis, right? Imagine uh, Lex Luthor planted a bomb in Metropolis. Well, you don't have an obligation to pick up the bomb and throw it in outer space, right? I mean, it doesn't make any sense to say you have a responsibility to do something you physically cannot do. But Superman has this responsibility. He can do it, and arguably he should do it. So we have to think about the ways that technology is changing us, changing, changing our obligations and responsibilities. So again, we're all stakeholders here in the technology-driven world. You might not be interested in robot cars, but robot cars might be interested in you, right, as they drive alongside you and your friends and family. Um, I like to close with this, uh, this quote from uh, British scientist Sir Martin Rees. He says, scientists surely have a special responsibility. It is their ideas that form the basis of new technology. They should not be indifferent to the fruits of their ideas. And I'm encouraged by the growing interest I'm seeing in technology ethics, and I'm encouraged by uh, the interest uh, that National Academies of Engineering has in inviting me here. Um, so I'd like to thank the Academy. I'd like to thank you all for being here, and have a good rest of the conference. Is there one question of the audience? Okay, Al. At the end of the day, do you think it will be um, ethics and culture, or laws and regulations, or technology that will limit the rate at which autonomy enters into our society, say for self-driving cars? Um, well, I think the answer to that depends on which kind of technology you're talking about. So in the case of self-driving cars, uh, te technology-wise, there's still lots of work that needs to be done with computer vision, for instance. Um, but also, laws and regulations are important. Insurance is really important, too. If the insurers are not on board with the risk, if even they are not comfortable with the risk, it ain't going to happen. Um, so law and ethics is obviously a hurdle, um, but ethics is also creepy in the discussion. So when, when law and policy are unclear, and they are unclear, our, our driving laws largely don't contemplate a, a robot driver, AI driver. When law and policy is unclear, it's often helpful to go back to first principles, 
to go back to ethics as your moral north star, right, as your moral compass to help point the way to sound law and policy. So I see that, uh, I mean, all three are part of the same ecosystem, um, and all three need to click together. You need to have a alignment, a syzygy between all three in order for uh, something to move ahead responsibly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Patrick, please join me again and welcome him. Thank you very much.